Hi there, welcome back to Medical Education in the New Millennium uh, for our class entitled Connecting and Collaborating Online and Harnessing the Power of Distributed Expertise. Um, we're really fortunate to have with us today Rohit Kakade. He is current medical student at Oregon Health and Sciences University School of Medicine. He graduated from the University of California, San Diego and blogs regularly at thebiopsy.com. And after Rohit today, we'll also have with us Dr. Anne-Marie Cunningham, who is from Cardiff University. And um, we're going to hear from Rohit after this short message from Medicine X. Welcome to Medical Education in the New Millennium, a new course from the Stanford University School of Medicine. This interdisciplinary course is produced by Stanford Medicine X and features talks from thought leaders and innovators from medical education, instructional design, cognitive science, online learning, and emerging technology. Over the course of 11 weeks, we'll consider how to build educational experiences, address the unique learning preferences of today's millennial medical students and residents, address gaps in the current medical education system, and explore what might be accomplished when all healthcare stakeholders are included in the conversation. If you are joining us for the first time, a quick reminder that there's a simultaneous conversation happening on Twitter right now using the hashtag MedX. Christopher Snyder, otherwise known as I am Spartacus, is the in-class moderator for today's program and will be taking questions from social media. So please make sure to start up your Twitter client to join in the online conversation and interact with today's speakers. Please also make sure to like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX. Please note, you are watching a live online program and there is a delay between real time events and the live stream you are watching. Tweets from our in-class guests will appear before you see the real time events they are tweeting about unfold on the video live stream. Hi all, my name is Rohit Kakade. I'm a second year medical student at Oregon Health Sciences University, founder and CEO of Lean On, and a student advisor at Medicine X. You can find me on Twitter at The Biopsy, or as Dr. Chu said earlier, on my blog at thebiopsy.com. Now some of you may be wondering what a second year medical student is doing here talking to you today. But I'm, I'm here to talk to you today about four things. Medicine, education, technology, and possibility, specifically from the perspective of a medical student. Indeed, one of many medical students who sits in a lecture hall for four hours every day, listening to multiple lecturers come and stand and deliver for those four hours. Now, this model can kind of be considered the analog model of medical education. It's incredibly unidirectional. It's not incredibly engaging, and it's not very exciting but it is the de facto model of medical school education today. Now, how do we as digital natives survive this analog landscape? Well, I would posit to you that medical students today go online to find resources to fill in the gaps in their medical education. We're ensconced in this web of resources, whether they're flashcards, whether they're visual mnemonic tools, whether they're question banks, what have you, we use them to fill in the gaps. But there's a problem with this method. It takes a lot of time and cognitive burden on our parts as medical students to go and track and synchronize our progress throughout all these resources. And as any medical student can tell you, time and mental bandwidth are precious, precious commodities. There was a report called A Decade of Reports Calling for Change in Medical Education. And it looked at 15 reports compiled over the last 10 years and it found eight congruent themes, one of which I'll highlight here. It was the use of new technology in education and medical practice. And specifically, 13 out of the 15 reports had recommendations to use technologies to support new methods of learning. This is not a new method of learning. What we need to do is somehow find a way to take all these resources that we use online right now and coordinate them in an intelligent platform that dynamically supports us in all the different ways we learn. So, pie in the sky stuff right now. Give me a platform that works on the PC that I use in the library, to the tablet I use at home, to the smartphone that I use on the bus on the way to school. 
that gives me the learning modules that I need in the way that I like to learn them in. And that also tracks my progress and gives me achievements when I've <clears throat> accomplished certain competencies and tracks those over medical school, over all four years of medical school, but maybe even farther than that. Maybe all the way until I'm an attending. So I can see where I'm doing well and where I'm doing poorly. And where I'm doing poorly, I can focus my efforts and make sure I'm becoming the best possible physician I can be for my patients. And in the spirit of Fred Trotter, what if we made this public? What if we allowed patients to access the, this information so they could see that they're getting the most competent physician for their problem? Let's go one step further. What if we made this free to access and cut medical education debt in half by moving the preclinical years from the lecture hall to the home? And what if we made this a national standardized educational platform by handpicking the best professors from different schools and making sure that they come together and collaborate to create engaging learning modules for us to access online? And then what if we made partnerships with local institutions? So instead of having a medical student have to move from a rural area to an urban area to learn medicine, they could stay in their home in a rural area, learn, at a, learn all the clinical skills that they needed to at a rural hospital. Would that increase the rates of physicians who go and serve in underserved areas? It's a possibility. Medical education and technology, there's a lot of potential. We are just starting to scratch the surface. Thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Anne-Marie Cunningham. She's a general practitioner and clinical lecturer at Cardiff University in Wales. She's the academic lead for e-learning for the Cardiff University Medical School. Dr. Cunningham is interested in the use of new technologies to further medical education and to help others understand how to use these tools to become better doctors. But before we have the pleasure of hearing from her, let's get a quick message from MedicineX. In 2015, Medicine X will be launching a new program called Medicine X Ed. This special conference, right before Medicine X 2015, will focus on medical education and what might be accomplished when all healthcare stakeholders can engage in a conversation about changing the culture of medicine through educational innovation. Of course, we'll discuss the role technology can play in medical education but we'll also look at gaps in our current educational system, such as participatory medicine, shared decision-making, patient engagement, cost transparency, patient safety and reducing harm, and cross-cultural competencies. What other gaps might we address at MedicineX Ed? Let us know what you think by tweeting our hashtag, MedEx. And make sure to sign up online to learn more about Medicine X Ed and how you can get involved. Hello everyone, thank you very much for inviting me here to speak to you today and hello to everyone out there as well. So I am Anne-Marie Cunningham, I'm a family doctor from the United Kingdom and I'm academic lead for e-learning in my uh, medical school. So that means that I help the students and the faculty think about how to use technology for improving education. So a bit of a geography lesson for you, just in case. I know, you know, we're from the other side of the Atlantic. So I am from, on here marked is Cardiff, and that's where I live and work. Uh, I'm also a GP, as I said, about 20 miles north of there in an ex-mining area it's in the South Wales Valleys. But this accent is not Welsh. I am from Northern Ireland, from this small town called Kilkeel. And like my fellow Irishman, Oscar Wilde, who said 125 years ago that we were, you know, we, we were having this common, uh, two, two countries divided by a common, la a common language. And it's still true. And I'm probably going to say a new some language that you might not understand. But I hope that because we're all committed and we're working in different healthcare systems as well, but there are many things that we have in common and trying to improve things for the, for the betterment of our patients is really what, we're, what joins us all here together. So I'm going to preface my talk by saying that there are two tr big trends which I think are really influential in thinking about what is going to be happening in the future of medical education. And these are the rise of networks as a mode of organisation and cooperation and working together and also the rise of openness and uh, transparency. 
So this mo model, and there are a few people who, who make this, this model uh, and talk about it, uh, and this comes from Harold Josh, who's, who's been really looking at learning, and he's a great person to be following and seeing uh, his, his thoughts and ideas about this. That we're moving from a 19th century model where artisans and craftsmanship uh, model of learning was apprenticeship to the 20th century model of the corporations and mass production and training on into networks as a mode of organizing our groups and, 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 and work. And then learning is social, uh, local and mobile. And Engelstrom and others who have been looking at this have, have used the same kind of model, talking about craft form of production, mass production and social production within networks. Then we've got the rise of open and we're all well aware of this. So we're increasingly being talked, talked to uh, and, and discussing being open in our practice, opening up data sets so that people can work with them, open government, open source as a way of developing software, open education like MOOCs. Uh, and opening up research uh, and it's, it's being said that actually openness, working across, sharing their data, this is the way to really improve what we're doing, to be efficient, to be, to be honest and truthful about what we're doing. So those are the two big trends that I think are going to be influential. So that's a little bit of the, the background, but what does this all look like in practice? So I'm going to start with an example which uses uh, a less common social network, Google Plus. Uh, <laughs> so, so I am. Um, a few a few months ago, I was in my uh, waiting area. I was in the. It was in the surgery. I was seeing an emergency appointment in the morning, and a patient came in with a yogurt pot, and the patient was worried that this that this inside the yogurt pot was what looked like a worm, and the patient thought that this had been passed by them in their urine into the toilet. They'd fished it out of the toilet bowl and they came down to see me to see was this something they needed to treat it. And I looked at it and I didn't recognise it and I spoke to my colleague and he didn't recognise it either. And I phoned the microbiologist and they said send, us, send it to us and we will send it to the reference lab in London and they will identify it and we'll know. And then I thought well maybe I could ask my network so I asked the patient, could I have their permission to share this story online? And I made a little video during my lunch, just before I sent it off to the lab, and I posted it. And this was the little video of the worm. And within 20 minutes or so, I had the answer. And the answer came from a microbiologist in Leicester, who was 150 miles away, and he said, that's not a worm. That's a leech, and it's a freshwater leech, and it's not a human parasite. So there is no risk uh, to this person uh, from this. So we had our answer. A week or so later, it was confirmed by the reference lab in, in London. <laughs> but we had the answer already. I was able to speak to the patient, explain to them you know, what, what was going on, let the, let the microbiologist send them a link to the discussion on Google Plus so they could see it as well. And we were all informed. And this is an example of, I'm going to use now Howard Rheingold, another Stanford scholar, uh, his model of thinking about whenever we're online. And we can move through these four different sort of stages. So the, the baseline, we have networking, which is he equates to kind of like handing out your business cards, letting people know who you are, moving on into coordination, where you're actually you being online, but trying to work together to uh, achieve some goal by, by saying we're, we're, we're this is, this is what we're doing. Uh, cooperation, where you're actually maybe making some new resources. Uh, it's a bit at a higher level. And collaboration, which is the hardest, where you're actually coming together with shared meaning and purpose to develop uh, a new way of working around something. And we know collaboration is hard because it's hard offline too, because it's collaboration that we most often have to do with our patients and with the people that we work with whenever we have to come to a shared working model of being able to progress. The other uh, analogy that I want to make is around this, what was actually happening? What kind of learning was going on there when I posted that and got that answer about this being a leech? Well, Anna Sford talked about there are two metaphors for learning. 
learning as acquisition and learning as participation. And I would say that this was more learning as acquisition. So there was a piece of knowledge which I didn't have, but I was able to acquire that knowledge, but participating in a network. But I didn't have to construct in a way that knowledge together. It was more about getting access to knowledge that was distributed within a network. Uh, participation is at a higher level where, well not a higher level, it's on a, on a, a different level where you're actually coming together and co-constructing the knowledge and that's actually a harder thing to do. Um, and, and that example is interesting but it's actually a pretty rare thing for me to actually come across that sort of scenario. That's why I'm able to identify it and share it with you. Um, but actually the things that I really need to know and the things that whenever you're working in teams and that's including team, the, team, the partnership and team that you have with the patient, that really requires this form of learning by participation and that's when being online and really collaborating online can be very powerful, but it still is difficult. So one of the things that we have to address is why there was a microbiologist in Leicester paying attention to me on Google+. Had I at some time thought, I better get a microbiologist into my network just in case somebody comes in sometime with a worm and I'm not sure what it is. Well, no, that wasn't the case. Alan, who responded to that, is actually somebody I knew because he was interested in the use of technology in education. And he was part of my network because of that. So we get back to thinking why I first started tweeting and being online myself. It goes back to about um, six years ago. And this was one of my, this was my very first tweet. Preparing for a seminar on medicine in the media, thinking about health 3.0. Now I know that um, medicine acts X kind of shuns the, the nomenclature of 2.0, 3.0, etc. And that's a good idea because that was a typo. I actually meant health 2.0. Uh, <laughs> but it made me sound more prescient than I actually am. <laughs> but now I've told you. But that was my first week and I couldn't really figure out what it was about. I got an invitation from a friend, I didn't really understand what I was going to use it for and I didn't use it for months and that's a common experience for people whenever they come to this. They can't, unless there is a little bit of guidance around, people around, friendly faces, they're not sure what it's about. So I asked, for me the motivation was going off to some medical education conferences and realising wouldn't it be great to be able to stay in contact with these people because unlike uh, the way that in primary care I actually have very strong networks with people that I work with and some of the things that I come across in thinking about the use of technology I can really do with having an extended network there because I need to test and be able to run ideas by a lot of other people who are not in the same place as me and sometimes it can feel a bit isolating whenever you're thinking about ideas and other people around are not thinking exactly the same way as you so you need to have a nice kind of uh, group of people around uh, who are able to support you through that. And I decided in that October to write my first blog post, it must just have been just about six years ago, where I kind of set out my stall. I want to link up with people in medical and health sciences education so that we can learn together. And I went off and I started searching for these people and I couldn't really find very many of them, but I found lots of other people. I found people in the US that were discussing Obamacare and healthcare in general. I find lots of people in education technology across all different sectors in the UK and elsewhere. And most importantly, I find the patients because this was at the time of the e-patient network was really burgeoning. There were blog posts left, right and centre. There were discussions going on and it was able to open my eyes up to different ways of, of thinking about my work and what I was doing. So we started, like I, as I said, using this hashtag, hashmedit, as a way of just trying to leave traces for people because every new platform would come along, I would go there, sign it up for Meded so that we could actually have a way, if somebody else was coming afterwards, there would be something there. Um, uh, there is now at this time, we're usually at 9 p.m. Eastern time, which I think is now, is uh, there is a discussion of hash med ed. We did the same thing in the UK at 9 p.m. UK time. Then we actually diversified a little bit by calling using hash UK med ed for our discussion. But we link up together and it's lovely to see all the discussions across uh, the, different, the different areas because there's so much that we have in common, despite the misunderstandings through the common language. And it, 
and through all this, I started seeing some examples which really showed me some of the power of this and actually moving into being uh, participatory in your learning. And I love this next example as a, a kind of glimpse of, in, in a way, what, uh, the, what the power can be. So this is a famous treater and writer. Uh, it is Atul Gawande, the surgeon uh, and, uh, and great writer and educator. And I was following him one day a few, a, few, a few years ago on a Sunday afternoon when I saw him tweeting about the Wimbledon final. So he's eloquent even in 140 characters uh, describing Djokovic's confidence. Uh, but I wasn't really that interested in what he was thinking about Wimbledon final. The reason I was paying attention to that tweet on that day was because that evening there was a discussion about the surgical checklist paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in a Twitter journal club. So Twitter Journal Club was started by a medical student and a junior doctor from the UK and they had decided that week to discuss this paper and I saw him tweeting and I thought sure what's the harm in asking I'll just say to him that we're having this discussion and see what happens and I could tell that he was actually um, he was on vacation with his family at the time but Twitter is quite lightweight you can actually manage to engage in it so I said to him, you know, we're, we're discussing this paper tonight. Do you want to, you know, do you want to join in? Uh, and he did. The discussion started with actually some of the usual criticisms of that paper in the developed world where people say it doesn't actually matter to us. All the changes were in the developing countries. And he came back and said, well, actually, we've done more studies and we've done qualitative research and we know what the different uh, aspects are that really make this work. And medical students were able to ask him questions. And they were actually really able to participate in the co-creation of this knowledge around this paper. That really is learning through participation. And there weren't just people who, not in this discussion, it's not just doctors and medical students. It's also people who are experts in patient safety who were contributing to the discussion. And those kind of examples keep happening again and again and again. So we can see where uh, it, what, what the, the, the two, the doctor and the medical student who set up the Twitter Journal Club did was they provided an opportunity there for cooperation, for people to come together and share their learning. So we got on to think about this idea of how is it that you can actually harness this expertise? How can you manage to get control of all of this? Which it was, was kind of alluding to like, all of everything is out there and how do you actually manage it? And there are some people that are starting to do a great job of that and I would really advise you to, to look in and see the kinds of uh, things that they're doing. So one of the, 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 the concepts that is that's involved in this is free open access medical education and this this term for it uh, came out of Australia and emergency medicine doctors about two years ago they say they were having a few pints of Guinness in Dublin always a good place <laughs> always a good place to get the creative juices going and this this hashtag came out of it and or the whole concept and, the, and they went on because actually for a long time we've talked about open educational resources but often they go into repositories, into portals and nobody uses them. But social media actually allows people to be able to create more themselves and if there is content for it to be distributed and talked about and linked through networks. And for, for you, if you're looking to find something, that can be really, really effective and a very efficient way of getting to what you need. So one of the uh, interesting groups, uh, again the emergency medicine doctors, are the Allium, Academic Life in Emergency Medicine. And one of the doctors involved in that, leading that uh, really, uh, is Michelle Lin, who's an emergency medicine doctor from San Francisco. And they do some wonderful case studies there where they tackle really quite difficult questions uh, in medical education. One was around the use of slang in the, the emergency room overhead heard by a, a medical student who doesn't really understand the context uh, and they, they, they set this scenario up and then say so what do you think and ask some questions around it and uh, because I'd seen this and tweeted about it we actually had uh, and, but, and others there were over 100 comments of discussion about that case and the comments were from all over the globe 
and they were from all different perspectives. Uh, there were patients who were discussing how they felt about the use of slang. So it wasn't just a conversation with doctors. And you, if, you're having, if you're having a conversation about medical education, you need to have the perspective of patients in, in it. And this allowed for that, to, for that to happen. And then they did a wonderful job of actually getting some expert opinion and then managing to create all of that together and sum up all of the 100 comments in the discussion, these two other views, and publish that. And not only have they done it for that case, just last week they've published all of them as an e-book um, through iTunes, so everybody can access those and see them. So they're, they're crowdsourcing the expertise and then doing a really good job of curating it as well. But it's not just groups of doctors that are doing it. And, there, and in fact, that it, within uh, this group, it's not just doctors either. They, they have medical students and also uh, other healthcare professionals. So everybody is able to work together in these tasks. But there are also medical students who are the people to watch. Uh, that William Gibson quote, you know, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. There are examples of that. There are examples. And one of those examples I like uh, to, uh, to think about is Eve Purdy, who's a, a, a medical student in Queen's University in Ontario. And this is a little map that Eve did out of her own, her own kind of personal learning environment, all the connections for her. So she, the different kind of blogs that she keeps, writes herself, the people that give her feedback, the different ways that she connects to people, has her ideas challenged, and all of them come down, as you can see, to better for patients, better patient care. And she is able to map out that real metacognitive level to be able to say all these different areas and how they're actually useful to her. So Eve's an example of a very highly self-regulated learner who can identify what her learning needs are and make a plan and be able to go out and address them and figure out how to use different networks to be able to do that. But we need to get everybody, we need to help everybody with this. Uh, we uh, and we can learn from the, the people who are furthest forward within this, but the challenge for us is to think about how we, how we manage to do this for, for, for everyone. So I'll tell you a little bit our course in, our course in Cardiff. We've just moved to a new curriculum. It's case-based. We expect learning to be active, collaborative, and we all want to support our students in learning. There is no s more sitting for four hours a day in lecture theatres. Uh, instead, our students work in small groups. They're out in the community uh, at least half a day per week from the second term of the course. And they have, uh, they, and we acknowledge that they're learning from many different places and we encourage them to share where they are learning. So we know that they use Facebook and they, so they, they can choose within their groups what, what to do. They use it because it's very quick, there's good social presence there, you're working on a task, you know somebody's read it, you can share a document. They have a wiki which they might use to be able to document more what they're doing, provide a kind of directory through different learning resources. And we also use a, a platform called Scoop It, which is based in San Francisco. And they, well, somewhere around here. And that's a platform for, for content curation. And the reason that we're really interested in that is because we recognise that our students are learning from all different places. It's exactly as we were saying, it is not just from textbooks and lectures and tutorials, it's online content from other universities, increasingly content that's made by other medical students. We have a lot of medical students engaged in making content across the UK. And everything that's on YouTube, these are just some of the examples. And then you end up with the issue, with the problem, how do you actually make your way through all of this? There is too much content. What is relevant? What is good quality? So we see curation as a solution to that. So we take all the content, we filter it, uh, add some commentary, which helps the audience know why, we're, why, why, why they're being directed towards it. And I guess one of the things you might wonder, who actually are the curators here? Is it the staff that are doing all of this curation? Well, in our case, it isn't. We're doing it together. The students are curating and the staff are curating and we're feeding back around a loop between us. So, and the way that works is that we set up pages for each of our cases 
and also for each of the groups. So the group is curating for their own group, saying these are the things that we think are resources that we came across that are very useful. We then have the people who've written the cases who are saying that's a really good resource, everybody should see this, adding commentary on, sharing it out to the rest of the case. We have different, different pa uh, curated pages for different subjects. So biochemistry, reproductive medicine, global health, they start getting their own pages as well. And therefore, the content can move easily between. It's no longer locked down within. Uh, well, we're, we're finding the content externally, and we're be able to move it through and, uh, and, and direct it towards our learners and get feedback from them. And we're interested in thinking, that what is it that does it take to be a good curator? Uh, and we think that there are two things. You need to be knowing the subject, be an expert in the content, and you need to know the audience. So to be able to know the subject, you need to to help, help the learners or the people you're creating for have a framework for this. This, in a sense, is thinking in, like analogous to thinking about reducing the germane load in cognitive load theory. So you're producing a framework. You are assessing the relevance and accuracy for your course. And then on the other hand, you have to know the audience. So is it the, the right level? Is it usable? Is it easy to access? And the best people at knowing the audience really are the audience. So if you're creating for, so if you're able to give feedback on those aspects and your subject experts are able to give feedback on the content, then you've got a win-win situation. So that, again, is using a platform for co co uh, cooperation and also, also some of these examples, these ideas of moving into actually uh, collaborating on, on constructing the knowledge together. But one of the things I think we do have to address is why is this collaboration so hard? Why is it really? And it's because we come, we come to things with our own mental models, which, are, which we've spent a long time developing and coming up with. And they help us go round every day with our in me mental models. And when you come across somebody who's got a different mental model to you, well, that takes a lot of work to actually manage to get through that and figure out and collaborate uh, together. And it's about, as we said, finding this shared meaning, often shared purpose. And this idea of shared mind, this comes from, shared mind is a concept that Ron Epstein, who's another family care doctor, described for what happens whenever you have shared decision making actually with a patient. It's not just a single decision. It's in the context of a relationship, you're working together and you're trying to come together towards a shared way of approaching the subject. And if we can get good at actually collaborating offline, then we're going to have a better chance of being able to do it online because these are the same skills, they're the same challenges. And, but it's, at the same time, it's, it's important that we do it because we can't solve all the problems by ourselves. There is not just knowledge out there that we can acquire. We have to be able to work together and participate and collaborate to be able to develop this knowledge together. Uh, this comes uh, from Fisher, this idea of sort of saying, actually, you really, to be able to have social creativity, you need to have networks involved who have distance within them, temporal distance, uh, spatial distance, coming from different places, and diversity. And with all of that, then together, you can manage to have creativity. But there must be some barriers to all this that I still haven't actually mentioned or alluded to. Otherwise, it would all be wonderful and fantastic and we'd be making probably much more progress. And that's because there are sort of some issues which are relevant in general, but probably particularly relevant in, in medicine. And one of the things that we worry a, a lot about, and rightly so, are these ideas of boundaries. Where are the boundaries? Uh, this is a photograph from a few miles up the road from where I grew up. This wall is the Mourn Wall, and it's, it's, it's a physical boundary. It's, it's, the, it's showing the boundary of the catchment area for reservoir. And we can see there a style. That style helps you understand when you cross that boundary. But social boundaries aren't like that. They're actually negotiated all the time in the moment, quite often. Uh, and you come across situations that you haven't thought about. And you have to figure out from, from your principles how you actually address that. So sometimes people feel uncertain about that. But actually, it's at the boundaries uh, and the ways of being able to cross them and the, the objects that help us understand the boundaries. That's really where so much of the learning is. 
So although they can feel frightening, they're also the place to really be interested and be thinking about uh, what, what's, what's really important to be uh, dealing with. I also have to, you don't really see this, this image don't mean much to you probably in San Francisco. I don't think you have quite the level uh, of CCTV and whatever as we do in the UK. But often people feel that there's a risk of actually being surveyed whenever you're within social media, that you're going to be judged for what you do and that you're going to be critiqued. And really to be able to move beyond that, we have to have leadership and it needs the people who are in charge, who are high up, to really say, not only are they going to participate and engage as well, but they're going to support people who are smaller or lower down in the hierarchy than they are to be able to participate in these conversations. And all of it then comes down to thinking about what is our identity as healthcare professionals? Where are where do we feel that power is and control? Do we think about being able to work through different contexts because that's, that's what we need to be able to do? Uh, who do we trust when we're online? And what is, what is the impact of all of this on our sense of who we are, what our work is, and what the meaning and purpose of it is? So that's what I want to leave you with. Uh, just some tips, and these kind of way are slightly ev evidence-based. It has been shown that if you're working and collaborating online in networks, the things that you have to do is a lot of the social talk. So the emoticon is your friend. You, you, you need to be able to share and give people clues to actually how, how things are, what, what the nature of the, the discussion is. You need to be generous. You will misunderstand what people are actually saying. So generous in spirit and also in cont contributing your time. And don't try to win. Well, I put this in because it seems that we're maybe possibly hardwired, that our reasoning hardwires us to try and win arguments. And trying to win online, it just doesn't work. So if you find yourself trying to win an argument when you're online, that's probably not the right thing to be doing. So those are my tips for how we can manage to make the most of networks uh, for, for furthering our education and improving patient care. much for that talk. Um, we're going to have a quick question and answer session now. Does anybody here have any questions right off the top of their head? I think, thank you, that was great. Um, when, when you're talking about using uh, these sorts of ideas in an educational setting, a classroom or, or what used to be a classroom, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering how you get uh, conversations started uh, among students or people, you know, in the network in general, and then also um, what kinds of leadership or guidelines do you sort of uh, preface before people start, you know, participating in these things? Is, is it just a blank canvas that they're supposed to throw ideas onto, or? How do, you, how do you give sort of those tips or maybe more, more detailed tips to those so communities? So with some of the, when we, when we started the um, hash meta discussions in the UK, we did actually come up with a little bit of a charter, which was saying these are, these are the things that we think are important. So we're not going to, uh, you, you must be respectful to other people that are here. You must not breach confidentiality. I didn't, haven't spoken about actually the things that we do with our students to help them develop digital literacies too. But we start off with sort of saying, there are two things that you must not do, which is breach confidentiality and be abusive to colleagues. And colleagues are everybody that you come into contact with through your work. It's not just people higher up in a, a hierarchy than you, it's everybody. So those are like the baseline. And these are the things you mustn't do. But then we spend a lot of time talking about and thinking about the things that you should do to give permission to participate. So we do that in the medical school. Online, when it's much wider groups, then we give some guidance um, for people that are new in about how to, to participate. Um, I think, I can't remember what your other first question had been. Uh, sort of, um, a lot of the online tools we're given uh, are, are these uh, places where anyone can throw up uh, any idea in response to something else. And 
Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so a lot of the tools um, are, are these places where people can throw up any idea that they want. How do you, um, I guess, sort of, uh, or do you attempt to guide these discussions in um, some ways so that people can I know think, what they're trying to construct? I think the most important thing is to listen. It's really, really important to listen. So before you actually try and start guiding anything, try and understand what's actually going on. Why is somebody saying what they're doing? Like I said, it's not about, because sometimes trying to guide too much can feel like trying to win. So if you come across, the really good thing is when you come across somebody you disagree with, that's gold dust. You really want to, to get that person and embrace them and be able to understand where they're coming from, because th that's really a gift to you whenever you're trying to learn. Because it's always, and that's the great uh, uh, Engstrom and other people s would describe it as, when you get a contradiction, that's where the maximum potential for learning is. So in a way you can be friendly um, if people are dominating conversations or whatever, you might try and take it up with them in another way or privately. But really these things aren't really such big issues. And uh, in a way it's like years ago people said we didn't know how to, you had to, to explain to people what a discussion board was about and what threaded conversation was. Not everybody knows this because of Facebook. So in a way some things are becoming um, that people are more familiar with platforms and some of the general ideas, but the guiding um, has to be with, in a way, sometimes challenging ideas, um, bringing new ideas into it, bringing that if you have a conversation that you think is really important, amplifying that, drawing people's attention to it. I didn't mention, but one of the most, I, I found after a while, I'd really wanted to meet these um, more people still in medical education. I wasn't going to get them all blogging and tweeting. That wasn't going to work. So we actually started a group on LinkedIn because nobody worries that they're going to post their holiday photographs to LinkedIn by mistake. So it kind of feels like a safer place to be able to discuss things from that point of view. But we still kept it completely open so that we could bring other people into the discussion, let them know what was going on. Um, but it's about trying to figure out which is the right platform for what you're trying to do. Um, who are the people that you want to have involved? There's a lovely Ahmed X talk, which you must watch, a panel discussion with uh, Colleen Young and Susanna uh, Fox and, and Meredith Gold, and, and, uh, where they're talking about this, this being in a health community and how you do it. And Colleen Young's got this lovely description of how you have to take people in, make them feel safe, have them in the kitchen, and then they move over into the other room. And in a way, building a community is hard work. The LinkedIn group took me a lot of time and effort to seed it and keep the conversations going in it. And uh, now it sustains itself. We've got well over a thousand members. People post things spontaneously without me having to get the discussion going. So I'm winning <laughs> in that sense. Um, and and it, just, it takes time and effort to do that. And you have to be prepared. Nothing is going to happen by magic in that way. It, it takes effort. Uh, I, this question is for Anne-Marie Anne Rohit. Um, you know, you talk about building community. I think uh, the Pamela Wrestler panel at Medicine Next is a great panel. Uh, we'll post it to the class website because I think it, it really speaks to this topic. But um, to build a community, you have to be on social media. So w w one question I have for each of you, um, one observation that I have is that uh, there's far more there are far more attendings that I know who are not on social media than who are. And there's far more students that I know who are not on Twitter or social media than who are. So for each of you, my question is, why do you think that is? And um, is that something that mm -hmm. we need to look at? And if so, how? From the student perspective, I would say the reason why a lot of students are not on social media for professional enrichment purposes, so to speak, or learning purposes would be, because, would be because we've grown up with these social media tools as a way to share our personal lives more so than our professional lives. So that, that mindset is ingrained when we go and enter Twitter or Facebook or, or not LinkedIn, but any of these other more popular uh, websites. To change that, I would say that we would need a lot of, so to speak, case studies of medical students who have used Twitter, Facebook, what have you, in a professional way that's enriched their learning and made them better students because of it. And if we can demonstrate that on a consistent basis to students from all health professions, I think we'd see a lot more use of social media. Yes, I, I think that this is completely right. There is this, uh, Michael Wesch and others described 
this idea of collapse of context. If you're a student and you've, uh, six years ago when I started a Twitter account, there were only geeks there. You know, it was, and I wasn't going to run into friends or family or anybody else. So anything that I was sort of saying, now the people that are the geeks are kind of like my friends. So I want to share with them when I'm, when I'm, you know, psych biking across the Golden Gate Bridge or whatever. So that's, that's, that's part of the social kind of like glue, which keeps everything going. But it's not, but I don't have the same issues or worry that uh, when I spoke to some medical students, he said, even when they're, so they've got friends and family that are there, even whenever they're involved in things like student, student politics, they feel uncomfortable tweeting about this because their friends and family, they don't really want to be discussing this with them. Um, so that's why, so, so a lot of people end up then segregating by platform. And that was one of the things that made us choose Scoop It as our, as our content uh, curation platform rather than Pinterest. Pinterest is the third most popular platform for sharing content after email and Facebook. But that means that most people's Pinterest pages are full of things that are personal to them. And a lot of people might not feel comfortable with thinking about your medical education content alongside what cupcakes you like or um, you know, what logos you like, whatever, whatever, but things that are personal to you. Now a little bit, this is this thing about balancing, does it matter? Are we going to shift into sort of saying that we can actually balance these identities in public? Um, but for if you're, if you're um, more junior, I think that's a, that's a more difficult balancing act for people. Uh, Follow up on the curation. Um, on the courses where you have the students and the faculty co-curating, co What's the shelf life of, of a page and and what do you think the kind of lifespan uh, because I, I, I imagine that the curating is a, is a great way to learn if you're a student um, and how often do you need to freshen it up? I'm sure it's constantly being refreshed to a point, but you know, when does something become too um, permanent that you kind of lose kind of momentum? Well, that's the thing. We don't want, we, we don't want to have all of the content from, so we're rolling our cases forwards into just after Christmas, we only started doing this um, 10 months ago. So uh, we're reviewing the content that's there already, sort of saying, uh, do we really want that there? Let's take that away. That's really good for seeding it. So we kind of see some as being content that seeds it and gets things going, that that's really the best of the best. But we still expect the students will come up with more. And there is actually still social norms in, it, in this. We, we've done some wonderful exercises with our students where we map online, uh, the way that they use different web services. Dave White and others in, in the UK have done work on, rather than thinking about na digital native and digital native and immigrant, of thinking about resident and uh, visitor ways of using the web. So if you're using it as a, as a resident, you're leaving more social traces there. And so we participated in an exercise where we got our students to do this and say, did they, did they think that they were using it in a different way because they were medical students? And they said, no, it's because of the tasks were set. So if you want to encourage collaborative learning, then you have to create an environment that's about that um, and, and, and say that this is actually what you value. Uh, the content, this, the idea about content going out of date um, is always something that actually comes up quite often and people are worried about things lapsing. Um, but in a way, this is not such a big issue because some of the, you know, some of the, the students find um, a piece of e-learning content that was made 10 years ago by John Hopkins about inflammation. That's not really going to go out of date. The mode of it might change. Maybe you would have made it in a slightly different way now, but essentially it's saying the same thing. Some of the news stories uh, in one of our cases, there was a lot of discussion about um, female genital mutilation. That was just a story that was going on at the same time. Students were paying a lot of attention to it, curating that into uh, their pages. Uh, but that content might not be so relevant the next year on. It had, it had currency th in that week of that year, but maybe not then. So we, we need to do a little bit of cultivation. Do you find yourself um, like desiring a, a platform more specific to the needs of the medical community or a platform that, that's for medical professionals? Or do you think that there's power in the larger, more general forms of the social network? This is a really good question. Uh, and I I'd, I'd talked, kind of said that very generally, I was talking about these open networks. Because if you go to a closed platform and you say, let's be able to discuss this as doctors or as whatever, automatically it starts closing down. And there is, 
There are some reasons for why you might do this, and especially as an introductory way to actually thinking about discussing ideas and whatever, but why are you actually being closed about it? My rule is don't talk of, about something about patients online without their consent. So have them be able to be involved in the conversation. Let them know when you're actually seeking information about their case online so they can see it and it is open and transparent. Um, I think there may well be, I can't predict which platforms are going to be successful, but I do know that it's absolutely right that there's not widespread participation in, in all of these things now. So either you build it into your curriculum to actually use a specific platform and try and work it out. If I was a learning management system, I'd be thinking that these were important things to build in, to make it easy, to bring external content in rather than make it more difficult, to have you know kind of leaky boundaries around things. Um, so in general, there are things that are for education, but I don't find myself specifically wanting something for just medical education, certainly that would be closed. I had a question, actually. Okay, yeah, okay I'll thank fill you. In. Um, at the very beginning of your talk, you, you gave an example of a patient coming in with the worm and it became yes. a leech, and you learned yes. that through a, a crowdsourcing your information. Yes. Um, my question is about the veracity of crowdsource information. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I completely yeah, agree yeah. with everything you've said, but um, medicine has built up a structure around medical journals, and our scientific knowledge comes from very, you know, credible sources, so to speak. How do you think the scientific community would respond to a physician always going online to Twitter or Facebook to find these kinds of uh, medical knowledge that they would normally go on PubMed and look for or something like well, that? Well, you can't find it. I sat with a patient and we actually tried, first of all, to see if we could find this online ourselves. So first of all, I was going with the patient to do the searching myself. We couldn't find it. So it seemed obvious that we were going to need to go somewhere else. The next thing is that I believe we really overvalue uh, peer review at the moment. Um, another Stanford scholar, uh, John Ioannidis, uh, has got the most cited paper ever about how um, most medical research is not actually very good. Uh, and last week, or two, the week before last, he published the follow-up, which is how to make it better. And he said, we need to be open about it. We need to be transparent. Most peer reviewers are not actually really the best people to be doing the job. Most people who are uh, in, uh, assessing grant applications probably aren't either. So this, this closed peer review actually probably makes it weaker than if we were open. Um, so I don't think, I think in a way, um, <laughs> the way that we value this might be changing over the next few, few, uh, few years. And, and, and it comes back to that idea that, that the, these, when you're working in a network, the truth, the openness, the veracity, comes from the openness, the fact that anybody can critique it, that we don't get embroiled into. If you're, if you're um, writing open source so software and you're putting it on GitHub, GitHub you're, you're putting it out there for the world to be able to see. That's how, uh, how that, you, know, you, you get the, the critiquing. And I think that we're going to see much, much more of that um, within medicine and within medical research. And that's going to be challenging, really challenging for people because collaboration like we said is hard and it has all kinds of ideas about your identity and what your role is and using data sets and uh, a lot of implications uh, a question coming in on Twitter from Courage Sings I think in response to the comment about students and and, and physicians not necessarily being present on social media in, in wide numbers. I wonder if it is also a fear of doing something wrong, mm -hmm. fear of losing one's job, being disciplined at school if I say something wrong. Care to comment on that? Well, I, uh, that was what I meant to allude to when, to when I said what are the barriers, that actually people feel they're being under surveillance and that the, count, the b way to counterbalance that is really from leadership, from people who have the power to be able to lead in those areas. So is that in terms of of def making more clear definitions of how to use social media? If well, there's a fear of saying something wrong, how do we, how might we address th that fear? I guess. Okay. So what happens? Something is said that's wrong. How do, whose attention does it come to? How do they respond? Something is shared that people feel that it shouldn't be shared. So do we treat that as something that's learning? That's a, an op an opportunity to actually 
talk about it whenever this is like, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but how do we actually get through this? Or do we say, you broke the rules. This is wrong. It maybe it even wasn't a rule that we specified. We can't imagine that everybody's going to know everything for every scenario that they come across. So that's what I mean by showing leadership that we're, you're actually, you're, you're developing. So, so for a big part of me, that's still why I like to think about concentrating on faculty and getting them used to these ideas and these behaviours so that they can be uh, supportive to their learners. Um, but of course, if somebody, if you've got a really clear rule, like you don't breach confidentiality, don't be abusive and you do it, that's not good. Um, but I'm more, I think, with regards to things about what our own personal moral behaviours are, I think that each of us has to decide for ourselves how we want to represent ourselves online. Those are our choices. Um, we have to be aware that people will make judgments about us by how we actually represent ourselves online, but there are choices. And I, and I feel that whenever people express their identities in certain ways, if it's not breaking my kind of golden rules or other things, then I think that in a way we should be, we should be at least considering that we support exp free expression. Thank you, Henry. Rohit, do you want to add maybe a student perspective to I that notion to of the fear of saying something wrong and getting in trouble? I was about to say Dr. Cunningham's last, last bit right there was about exactly what I was going to say. There, as medical students, we are taught that what we do as future professionals not only reflects on us, but on doctors as a whole. So we are told to scrutinize our actions to make sure that we're not making anybody else look bad as well. Um, I, I do have an anecdote. Um, a friend of mine who goes to another medical school, he and his classmates released a video online. It was a parody of you know, what medical student life is, which is pretty much just studying in a library all the time. But <clears throat> it got released online, and within a day, administration had contacted that student and the people who made that film and had basically put them on professional review, saying, oh, what you've done reflects poorly on the school. Everyone, all the medical students thought it was completely fine because th they thought it was a great expression of individualism and how you know, this will make us look more human to patients you know, and have them empathize with us because we go through a really hard process that not a lot of people know about. Um, but the administration saw it as something completely different and there was this discord in mm -hmm. expectations. So I think having those rules, as you said, delineated and some kind of like golden rules that you don't violate, delineated for students would make it more of an encouraging environment for them to go onto social media and contribute. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really, I think that in a way we find it, in general, doctors are still a very trusted profession. Uh, there are probably good, there are probably reasons for that. There'd be a lot of cognitive dissonance if you were going to see your doctor and you didn't actually trust them altogether, but you were having to, <coughs> uh, certainly in the UK, I can't really speak for, for over here, but I, I believe that we're, we're still a very trusted profession. But we've nothing to say actually that in, in, in the main, this trust actually comes out and is generated as far as we know within the consultation. People trust doctors that they feel respect them, pay time to them, explain things to them and are good professionals. The idea of the global trust which comes along with the profession I think is there that we start off from a, you know, a reasonable position that we're going to be, to be trusted. But I don't think I don't think that altogether we're judged um, by, 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 the, by the, the moral behaviour of other doctors, completely. Uh, but I do think that, that the idea that you would, could tell a story um, in a kind of parody which would explain to patients what a hard time you're going through, whether or not that would work without knowing what patients actually understood by seeing that. So if your aim is to explain to patients what a hard time you're going through, talk to them about it, work out with them what's actually going to help them understand that because uh, that mightn't be the best way to do it. But at the same time, we have, to, we have to think about often the things which cause problems in social media are things which are happening anyway. So the, the fact that it causes discontent in social media is just a touchstone to us to let us know that there's an issue here. And that's, what, I mean, one of my favourite examples is, is, is around like alcohol culture. In a lot of uh, medical schools, are very pro-alcohol culture. That's the problem. The representation of it in social media is a secondary problem. Okay, well, thank you. Um, also, thanks to Sherry Reynolds, Dr. Ryan Madnick, Annette McKinnon, Ian Pereira, and Jess Schwartz for joining us online on the Twitter chat. And thank you so much, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you. Thank you. 
If you like what you see in this class, be sure to check out our online course, Engage and Empower Me, a new online class from the Stanford University School of Medicine. We are featuring presentations from patients and experts on participatory medicine. Through this course, we hope to empower you to take part in creating a more inclusive and collaborative healthcare system. The course can be found at class.stanford.edu. As a reminder, this program is made possible by support from the Stanford University School of Medicine, Department of Anesthesia, Stanford AIM Lab, Stanford Hospital and Clinics, and the Agency for Healthcare Research Quality. If you haven't yet done so, please take a moment to like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX so you can continue the conversation online and stay informed of program updates. From all of us here at Stanford Medicine X, we want to thank you for joining us today and remind you to join us again next Thursday, November 6th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for another edition of Stanford Medicine X Live featuring a new class on medical education from the Stanford University School of Medicine called Medical Education in the New Millennium. Next week, we are featuring founder of the Project-Based Learning Lab at Stanford University, Dr. Renata Fuchter. For all of you out there taking time to tune in with us tonight, thank you for joining us and being part of the conversation. A special thanks to our guest panelists this evening. From all of us at Stanford Medicine X, we'll see you next time. <laughs>